Good morning. Hey. We, we had to wake up very early. I'm Stuart Butterfield. And I'm Cal Henderson. And I'm a Mac. And I am a PC. There we go. Well, I got way more applause than I thought. Um, so we're making a web-based massively multiplayer game. I'll do this part really quick because we're not here to pitch. But uh, the intention is to do something like what uh, the Wii did for consoles in the space of massive multiplayer games. Because there's a lot of people who haven't played them. There's obviously some big successes, but there's a much bigger potential audience for these kinds of games. Um, and one of the ways we're going to do that, well, actually, I'll get into it in a second. I'll give the, the history. We have an excellent chance of being successful because we failed at it before, and the odds of failing twice at the same thing are... Pretty low. Uh, yeah, astronomical. Astronomical. So in 2002, we started a company called Ludicorp, and we were trying to make a game called Game Never Ending. Same thing, a web-based, massively multiplayer game, except it was 2002, so a lot of things are different. Chief among them, it was impossible to raise money for consumer-facing internet startups, because it was post-dot-com crash, it was post-September 11th, um, WorldCom and Enron, you know, actually a much, much more difficult time to raise money. So we ran out of money when we were partway through making the game and tried to do something else with the technology. That something else was Flickr. Flickr got bought by Yahoo, and we spent several years doing that. So there's uh, four of us from the Flickr team started this new company, Tiny Spec, and we're making Glitch. So part of the intention here is to do something that's much more lightweight. Um, I put inexpensive in quotes because what I mean is cheap, but cheap sounds bad. It's not bad. It'll be um, good. Yeah. There's um, some historical precedents and some threads in technology development that we're kind of picking up. Part of that is the early text-based multiplayer games, MUDs, and specifically Moose, and that's the model we have. And we'll get into that in a second, but the, most of the stuff that you do in the world is based on um, this item-verb interaction. There's stuff, and you can do things to it. So you can think of that as objects and methods. It's totally 2D, not even 2.5D isometric, um, and um, playable in the browser. We're using Flash, not necessarily tied to Flash, but it actually is pretty helpful. And when I say cheap, the goals here are to introduce items into the world in a, with about one hour of effort, all in. Uh, 30 minutes for a new location, 10 minutes for new sort of atomic elements of gameplay, and to be able to fix things instantaneously. Because we got really used to being able to deploy new code 50 times a day in the context of Flickr. So here's a, a very quick example of what I mean. In AAA console or MMO development, if you want to introduce a new item, you'll get some concept art. Someone will go and build a 3D model of that. Um, then it'll go to texturing, animation. You'll worry about things like whether the arm is occluded when the thing is animating. For us, sometimes we do sketches like this, sometimes not. We get some sample. We wanted crabs in the game, so these are some crabs. And uh, we said, no, these ones, they're supposed to be an homage to Mario. These are too Mario-like. Uh, but this one's good, but I don't like the claw being one bigger than the other. So we got these ones, and then we were done. So there's a, a, able to produce amounts of content that would otherwise be impossible. And um, trying to kind of break one of the fundamental laws of engineering, which is you can't be cheap, fast, and good, trying to do all three. Um, and we had some experience with that same attempt in the context of Flickr. Um. So one of the really big things we learned, uh, Flickr, and I guess the whole of the rest of the web has learned it by now, is that it's a real advantage to be able to both rapidly develop stuff, um, but to help that rapid development, to be able to rapidly get stuff you're building uh, released to your customers. Um, so kind of AAA uh, traditional game development is a very slow process. Um, but web development is a very fast process. Um, if we add a new feature to a, to a web app, um, when, un, until you get into the really big scale where everything starts to get awful anyway. Um, in the kind of small to medium scale, if we can release stuff really fast, we can be really agile. Um, it's, uh, it's a lot better way to work. This is pretty easy on the web, um, really because of the awesome stack that we have to work with on the web and such a high level of abstraction. If I go and build a web app tomorrow, my first thought isn't how am I going to write a web server? Or how am I going to write a network driver? Or even uh, you know, how am I going to... Uh, place the pixels on the page. We already have all of these tools and high level of abstraction to be able to do these things really fast and cheap. And we have interpreted languages. We don't have a big compile build cycle for, for most kind of scales of web apps. So this is awesome on the web. Unfortunately, it's much harder um, in persistent game worlds for a couple of reasons that I'm going to talk about. Um, 
And we have a lot of experience of building things on the web, not so much experience of building things in games. Um, one of the biggest advantages we, we ha immediately have over traditional uh, kind of AAA or traditional MMOs um, is that we have a web-based client. So um, our main game client is in Flash. Um, it's on the web. And the immediate advantage that we get over desktop kind of uh, shipped shrink wrapware is that if we make a change to the client, we just push a new Flash file onto our content delivery network. And as soon as somebody hits the page to load it again, they have the latest version. So we don't have to ship a box out to people. We don't have to do what lots of the traditional MMOs do and have half a day of downtime every week while we uh, push upgrades to, uh, to the client. So that's obviously pretty straightforward for anything based on the web. Um, Traditional uh, MMOs, you can see here, this is my installation of World of Warcraft, which has 20 gigs of stuff on my hard disk, which I have to download before I can play it. And maybe I'll have to download another extra gig a week. That's kind of ridiculous. Um, the way in which uh, we can keep the client nice and lightweight is by having a lot more stuff that sits on the server. So here's um, some XML that describes a location, maybe even the location you're looking at on the other screen here. Um, and that XML sits on the server and is pushed to the client as it needs to understand it. And we can make real-time updates on the server and get pushed to the client immediately. But this pushes responsibility for content updates over to the server. Um, so we have to have uh, and it's some kind of awesome server infrastructure. With web pages, it's easy to make updates to code on the server, because I make one request, and then I make another. All of these individual requests, we can just stick an update somewhere in between these requests, in between the requests. Um, with a game server, that's a lot tougher, because we want to stay constantly connected. Um, we don't want to kick all of our users off every time we want to make some kind of update. So our solution to this looks a little bit like the web stack, if you think about it like that, where we have our, our web server, our Apache, is actually a Java server. Um, and then we have another kind of ring within that, which is our PHP, our Python, our Ruby, or whatever, um, which in our case is JavaScript. So we run JavaScript as our language which describes the game logic inside a Java server. So it kind of looks a little bit like this. We have our outer layer of Java, which is our persistent. We don't change it so often. Um, does our things more like our web server. And then we're, very, uh, we're able to quickly write logic that sits within that and quickly release that. It gets, it's like an interpreted language. It gets compiled on the fly. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't require people to disconnect. Let's home make our quick updates. Um, and to go with the, the logic side of things, so we can push logic really fast, we have this uh, object uh, data store. So we're, we're a NoSQL shop, I guess. Um, and we have all these little data objects. So we need to build a whole bunch of tools that allow us to manipulate those. Stu. And I was just showing, while Cal was talking, trying to distract you from what he was saying, uh, a time lapse of some editing. So here's another one. Um, this is an in-browser tool we have for designing the world. And you can drag and drop from a palette, resize, rotate, um, put things under different layers, set the parallax ratio between the layers. Uh, so that's what the, I'm, this is the time lapse of me actually working. So I'm placing stuff here. Some of the things I'm placing are just purely decorative. Um, and those things are described in an XML file. Um, and some of the things are actually items that people can interact with in the game world. So these are mining nodes. People can mine the rocks that are placed there. Um, here I'm editing the properties of little coins that you can jump up and hit and get some bonus points. The XML that describes this is kind of analogous to HTML of a page. And all of the assets that um, we use for the decoration are kind of like the CSS. So I'm going to switch for just a second to a browser. Um, oh, wrong browser. Oh, I don't even have that page open. Never mind. I'll go back to Cal. But um, <laughs> <laughs> that uh, editing that happens in the browser generates an XML file, which becomes the physics model for both the client and the server. So in the client, it's when you're jumping around and walking the world. And for the server, it's the stuff that Cal was just showing, um, the yellow dots are the pathfinding lines for NPC movement and stuff like that. And then the XML is um, what actually gets stored and persisted on our servers. OK, so we have um, our XML JSON blobs are our, our model of the world. And that might be the model of a player or a location in the world or an item. Um, and we have JavaScript that describes how it works. Um, but writing code is pretty boring. Not only is it boring, it's actually pretty slow compared to uh, uh, you know, doing more or less anything else. Um, so instead of writing code for every little bit thing that happens in the game, um, so say we had this little piglet. In fact, we do. And you want to be able to hum to the pig in the game, because humming to pig piglets is obviously something that most people would want to do. So there are several ways we could go about this. We could write a whole bunch of code about how to hum to piglets, or we could uh, build a little web-based tool that lets us uh, click 
I'd like to hum to a piglet, and I'd like it to say this message, and I'd like it to take away some of my energy, but make me happier, because obviously humming to, uh, humming to piglets makes you pretty happy. Um, so we have all of these uh, suite of web-based tools which then generate JavaScript for us. So the JavaScript describes the behavior. Um, and if we need to do kind of simple behaviors like this, we can just do them very quickly. A few clicks, it generates code. But if we want to do something more complex, um, then we can just go in and write custom JavaScript for whatever we want. So it's just like using um, any kind of web framework, um, but sometimes you just want to drop down straight into language and write something very specific for your needs. But most of the time, building a simple CRUD app, we can use Rails and, and not worry about all of that stuff. That's pretty flexible for us. So we can get a long way with that. Yeah, and everything in the game works that way. So items, recipes. Um, I'm going to show another video now of um, the pineapple upside down pizza making. Um, Cal's going to show the recipe for that. Uh, so here I am walking down the street, and I have a bag with all my cooking ingredients. I open that bag, take out my Mike Tyson grill, and um, go to use it. I show a bunch of recipes. The ones that are grayed out are ones that I don't have the ingredients for, and list the ingredients I don't have in red. Um, the ones that are white, I can actually make. I can make a pineapple upside down pizza. I have enough ingredients to make four, but I'm only making two at this time. If we want to change the recipe for these kinds of things or add new recipes, it's literally a matter of seconds. And we can press publish, and then it's on the dev server, um, and then deploy to production in a few instances. So we can constantly be adding new kinds of content in this way. We let people experiment as well. So I'm dragging in some new items, um, trying to make something. It seems like this would make something on the grill. And indeed, this one, in this case, discovered a new recipe. And those kinds of, again, atomic bits of content we can add in a matter of minutes. Um, so we have these tools for, for everything we do. And uh, you know, web-based tools make our content production really quick, which makes it really cheap uh, or inexpensive, in quotes. Um, so we have the same thing for doing stores or quests or achievements or anything that's in the game. And it all basically outputs JavaScript. So simple web-based tools plus the ability to fast deploy this code means that, um, well, hopefully, we win by being able to produce content fast and cheap. However, it's not just web tools. This is not the only way in which we'd like to uh, take our knowledge of the web and make it useful. Um, we also want to make a, a game that itself is web-like. Yeah, so we have um, pages for pretty much everything in the game. And having a web page for something means we have a, a resource available for it. I mean, you can point to it. So this is, these are very ugly because we're you know, just started doing alpha testing. We have another six or seven months before we launch. But this is the page for our location. These will be publicly referenceable, so you can tweet out places that you visited or if you bought a house. It happens that there's three houses here, and two people already bought them. Um, again, here's an encyclopedia entry for that same piglet that we showed earlier. Um, here's a profile page, uh, listing of achievements. and. Um, Again, I think the key point here is that having the page means people can look at it, obviously, but it also means that it's accessible to machines and we can start building stuff on top of that. So the, the final kind of uh, piece of the puzzle is that we want to uh, take what we've learned from, uh, from the web, specifically from Flickr, and provide a whole bunch of APIs into everything. Um, something that's not usually done with uh, kind of traditional MMOs is that we'd like other people to be able to build tools to play our game. We'd like to extend it onto other platforms. Once we can provide... APIs, and not just kind of show your avatar on another site, but rich integrated game APIs. So we can actually have a useful experience in all of these other environments that already exist and already have a lot of users um, and can just offer really rich gameplay. So stuff like SMS, email, Facebook, the mobile platforms. Um, and I think that would be pretty awesome. Yeah. OK. Um, you can uh, go to glitch.com um, and sign up to be in our beta or get more information about the game. Right. Follow us on Twitter, play Glitch. That's about it. We have the red flashing time is up thing. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, guys.